A fungally diverse ecosystem delivers nutrients in a partially built form is so, so important to where we're about to go in terms of the immune function of the plant. And I have in my own mind kind of a labor budget when I approach orcharding. And, and a fifth of that labor budget gets applied to pruning. I mean, sometimes it's more, but it depends on how much you've stayed up with it. An another fifth of that labor budget gets applied to the spreading of mulch, the, the building of that fungal duff ecosystem. Another aspect is the, the insect pests and the disease, the sprays, the part that most people think that's what orcharding is. Another fifth of it is thinning the crop. Now there are ways to chemically thin where it's not a fifth of your labor budget, but when you're doing it organically, there is a lot of hand thinning and you will spend a lot of time doing that. And organic growers with really heavy setting varieties might do things like a table salt spray or, or use vegetable oil to smother the second and third round of blossoms. When, when an apple blossom cluster opens, there is the king bloom, and that ideally gets pollinated. It grows the biggest fruit because it has a jump start. And then there's a second round and a third round. Some varieties, it seems like they all open at once, but it's possible to smother or burn out the flower parts on the second and third round of flowering because pollen's been delivered to the king bloom and the pollen tube's already in place, so it's not affected. But that's, that's on a scale. I don't do that. You know, for me, it's still hand thinning, and that means having free cider evenings where a few friends come over <laughs> and drink cider while they're hand thinning. It's, it's, it's a fun way to build community as well. But that's another fifth. And then the other fifth is harvesting. You know, it's, I mean, a big, heavy crop year. But the point of that is just to establish that there's this component where you spend some good time bringing in Ramiel wood chips. You do things for the soil, for the biology. And that's the part often overlooked. Now, not only is fruit nutrient dense in terms of vitamins and minerals, but it's also really meant to be a good medicine for us. And one of the things that research out of the University of California Davis, the work of Allison Mitchell has revealed, is that how we grow really impacts the antioxidant levels of the fruit that we eat. And so in a, a more conventional IPM system or a conventional organic system where 20 sprays of sulfur are used, that's a whole different scenario than what I'm going to describe in terms of holistic growing or wild fruit. And that's important because this is where our bodies use these constituents. It's, it's not just the growing of the apple, but if these constituents are in there, it's good for us. And, and we're going to examine how that comes about. We'll just spend a little time on ecosystem connections in wrapping up this part about how nature deals with pests and disease. And here we're talking about the whole surrounds of the orchard. Um, you might have a 10 acre orchard and you can weave biodiversity into place. But when it's a home orchard setting or there's fruit trees in various places around a farm like this where there's so many different plants growing and people are conscious of letting the wildflowers bloom, of having successive bloom for the bumblebees throughout the season. Uh, this plant here is a member of the sunflower family. And I grow this in part for the bumblebees, they really love it, but this is elecampane. And elecampane is, we harvest the root because it's a great expectorant for cleaning out the lungs. You don't have to know that, you just have to know <coughs> that we're about to jump in big with biodiversity. So one term from permaculture is that of dynamic accumulators. This is this notion of a deeper tap-rooted plant getting minerals down in the subsoil. Those minerals go into the leaf of that plant that plant falls over and decomposes, and now those minerals are available on the surface at the, on the humus layer interface. And so certain plants are noted, like chicory is noted as being good at accumulating zinc. Uh, comfrey is good at accumulating calcium. Um, dandelion is good at accumulating potassium. So this is an aspect of tap-rooted plants that I really, really like to have as part of my orchard. And when I talk about comfrey, uh, this to me is the rock star of my plants underneath my apple tree. This is a, a medicinal herb that is also known as knit bone is one of its common names. And it's the allotonins in comfrey that is really good at helping heal tissue. So knit bone, if you had a broken bone and you set it, a comfrey poultice would help that heal a lot faster. You wouldn't want to put the comfrey poultice on first before you set it because it would heal it 
broken, out of position. Um, but Comfrey is a plant that gets to be about three feet tall, and after it goes to flower and falls over because it gets heavy top weight, a new flush of growth comes, and it falls randomly. And each of those spots where it falls suppresses the growth of other plants, so it becomes more open <coughs> around the, the drip line of my tree. One thing to know about Comfrey is if you see seed available from somebody, you don't want to buy the seed because that means it's a fertile type of comfrey. And if you plant that type of comfrey, your whole landscape becomes that one plant, no matter what you do. And I've seen a, a farm in Quebec where five acres was just comfrey. So back in the 40s, 50s, they crossbred the European comfrey with the Russian comfrey. And it's what's known as the Bocking cultivars. And Bocking cultivar 4 and 14 are kind of the ideal in terms of depth of root, six to eight feet. That means bringing up minerals from far down below. And it doesn't set a fertile seed. So it, it can only spread by the roots <coughs> getting out a little further. And it's not as invasive sometimes as people think. But I will give you the disclaimer now. If you don't believe everything I'm telling you about comfrey, or you change your mind down the road, and then you can't get rid of comfrey, I'm telling you now. This is, this is a permanent kind of planting once you make it. But comfrey is something, we're going to talk about foliar teas, fermenting herbal teas, for how you go about that. And I use comfrey particularly for the calcium. And calcium is a very important aspect of, of fruit growing. Comfrey is also something that those plants with more of a stocky base, unless you mow them and flatten them completely, are a great haven for beneficial insects during the winter. So that notion of always mowing everything down and cleaning it up, we're going to take that on because we want to provide that haven for the good guys to be there in the next spring. Comfrey is something I also, as my resource base, we dry lots of wheelbarrow loads of comfrey just for the chickens. I don't live near the ocean. I don't get oyster shell. That's where they get the calcium from during the winter. So let, let's get a little into this notion of what goes on right there around the roots when apple roots and peach roots and raspberry roots interact with other plants. So all roots respire, by which I mean they give off carbon dioxide. And in a meadow ecosystem where it's very diverse and there's tap-rooted plants as well as some grasses and clovers and that whole mix of things that makes diversity possible, um, apple roots are not bothered by that level of carbon dioxide. And the more tap-rooted plants you have with that bigger mass on the top, things like comfrey, things like the rhubarb, things like lovage, the more room in the humus there is for apple roots. So that, that's a happy scenario. On the other hand, a totally grass system, grass is very dense, and it gets denser when you mow it regularly. And when a sod, subject to being mowed every week or every 10 days, whatever, um, that root system is, is basically 20 times denser per cubic foot than that of that meadow ecosystem. That means when it's respiring and giving off carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide levels are 20 times higher. And what apple feeder roots do in that scenario, the tree can thrive, the tree can be green, but they go deeper down for their nutrition. Deeper down, <coughs> they can absorb soluble ions, but it's only in the top several inches where that partially built advantage exists that allows the tree to have reserve energy, to have more of an immune function. So if, if you're big on growing your fruit trees in kind of a golf course setting where you regularly mow, it works, <coughs> only you need more medicine because the tree can't produce its own medicine. You see how we start to fall into this need to spray, this, this idea of fungicides to deal with disease. And it, you wouldn't think that that was part of the choice, but th that that's part of where it comes from. So I do something I call biological mowing, and I'm, I'm kind of a natural for this because as the older brother, my dad would always tell me to mow the lawn. And I quickly learned that if I hit the metal pipe that was out in the backyard within the first five minutes, he would make my brother mow the yard. So I've naturally come up with reasons why we don't want to mow so much. Um, what I do, this goes back to the feeder root cycle of the tree, is when the apple tree comes into petal fall, when the blossoms come off the tree and fruit just begins to set, that's when the spring feeder root flush begins. I go around and I take a sigh, and I'm using a, 
a European sigh in my system. You know, if you had a bigger orchard, it would be a sickle bar, but the sigh is a, is a really amazing tool. And I'm not talking about the curved handle of the American sigh where you have to curve your spine in kind of the same shape, and it's not that fun to use. The European sigh, the Austrian sigh, has a straight snath, or just a slightly curved snath. And that allows you to keep your back straight. And so when you're swinging that sigh, it's, it's just a very meditative kind of work. And it's so quiet. You know, there's no hum of a weed whacker. It's, it's just you and, and nature. Um, I go around each tree and I will pull the higher grasses from underneath. I usually don't cut the comfrey because it's just coming into bloom. One of the beautiful things about comfrey is when the apple tree stops blooming, the bumblebees go to the comfrey. So I, comfrey is going to handle itself. I pull things outward and then I go around the tree and pull things inward. And I end up making more of a mulch ring around the outer canopy of the tree. When I do that kind of mowing, you know, it's not regular, it's more of a shock to the system. So all those plants literally shrink their root systems as well in response to that upper cut. So that makes more room in the humus just as I need it for the feeder roots. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm laying down that meadow ecosystem. Uh, you can use the word grass if you want, but it's a mixture of all kinds of herbs and flowers as well as grasses. Just at the point when things are starting to seed up. So if, if any of you have grown oats as a cover crop or you've seen farmers growing wheat, you're aware that in the spring it's really green and lush. The nitrogen level is high. And then the oat plant starts to form seed and it starts to get a little bit more golden in the stalk. And if you were harvesting it for the grain, it would go all the way to being rigid and strong, totally golden and high in carbon. Well, there's a transition from high in nitrogen to high in carbon. And just as seed starts to set at the time when farmers would traditionally cut hay because it was optimal in nutrition in the forage, um, that's when the carbon to nitrogen ratio is on the order of, you can guess, 40 to one. So I'm laying down a ring mulch that's favorable to the fungi, that opens up room in the humus, suppresses the return of that growth a little longer because I've laid it down more as a pile rather than chopping it all up into bits. So that's what I do for my spring mowing. Then I might mow aisleways in the summer and I'll usually alternate that just so I have more things in bloom. And then I'll do a fall mowing, but I don't do a lot of mowing. And it's, it's what I do do is tied to things that are happening with the tree.